Over the last few weeks, we've been uh, doing a series called about going against the flow. And we just realized that as Christians, we're a little different to the rest of our, the society that we live in, that we have different priorities and that we have different um, principles that we believe and uphold and stand by. And sometimes it feels like we're swimming against the tide of public opinion because of the things that we believe in. And this morning, I wanted to talk a little bit about when people rub you up the wrong way. Now, I know they never do that to you because you guys are all perfect. You know, I just look at Esme and just know she's perfect, uh, perfect nuisance, but otherwise okay. Um, but you know, the truth of the matter is we all have people who rub us up the wrong way. I love this little cartoon. I fired my masseuse. Today, she just rubbed me up the wrong way. And it highlights for us that when we rub someone up the wrong way, we annoy and or irritate them. And you know what the sad part is? Often we don't do it intentionally. Sometimes it just happens. Sometimes it's because we're just difficult people. Sometimes it's because you're a difficult person and I rub you up the wrong way. But God wants us to live differently. He wants us to live in unity, not to rub or to be rubbed up the wrong way. And much of the living of the Christian life comes down to how well we get on with other people. Scripture makes it plain that, that God loves it when we live together in unity and where we can enjoy together a life that uh, is intertwined, intermeshed, is supportive and encouraging. Paul um, highlights this repeatedly through his letters, but also there's that great scripture in Psalm 133 verse 1 that the king of Israel, David, wrote. He said, how good and how pleasant it is when people live together in unity. You know, there's a power in unity that changes things, and it certainly changes our attitude. But you know what? The ability to get on with others takes great effort. If you're married, you know that's true. Now, it may not be that your marriage partner is difficult. It might be you. That's the truth. But the reality is, in any relationship, we come to that relationship from very different backgrounds. We have different experiences. We have different families. We have different friends. We come from different environments. Sometimes we even come from different worlds. Some of these ladies are from where? <laughs> the truth of the matter is, when you get together with somebody else, the challenge is we bring all that stuff with us. And so for us to be able to live together harmoniously takes a great deal of effort. And a marriage that works is one that we invest in constantly and consistently. And so as you journey through life, I'm sure by now that you know that you will come across people who simply run you up the wrong way. They might not do anything specific, but there's just something about them that gets under your skin. Realistically, there will be times when you rub others up the wrong way also. And you know what? We've got to learn to live together harmoniously in spite of that. Today we're going to look at how to get along with difficult people. If you're on the receiving end of somebody's irritating behavior, these principles will help you handle um, that difficult situation. And if you're on the giving end, hopefully we'll learn some skills and some uh, uh, abilities and make some choices that will change the way that we interact with others as well. So if you have your Bibles with you, go with me to Colossians chapter 3. And we're going to read from verses 12 to 17 today, but we're not going to be covering them all in this session. So Colossians 3, 12 to 17 says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. 
Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Last week in our discussions of uh, Colossians 3, verses 5 to 11, we came across a list that contained five negative attitudes that Christians are to avoid. Do you remember what they were? Negative attitudes or ne negative actions. In Colossians 3, 5, it says, Put to death sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. But remember, we spoke about the fact that Christianity is a positive faith, not simply a negative. It's not that we simply are against things, but we, we also genuinely, strongly believe in things. And here in the list we've read this morning, here are five positives to counteract the five negatives. It says that we're to clothe ourselves with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness, and with patience. You see, God's instruction to us is that we need to choose these attitudes for ourselves. Not to be like others who choose to be antagonistic, um, aggressive, and angry. That we as the people of God need to choose to be different because we are different because of who God is has made us to be. And so the first point he raises here in our verses this morning is, remember who you are. In Colossians 3.12 it says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Whenever you see a therefore, ask yourself what it's there for. Therefore is a connection. So what Paul is doing is connecting these thoughts to all that has gone before. And what Paul has been saying to us is that as Christian people, when we accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and asked Him to forgive us of our sin, that He came and dwelt in us and with us. He put His Holy Spirit in us so that we could live differently, that we had the power to be different that we would no longer live the way that we usually live, but live supernaturally. And so the verses that we read this morning are a result of what God has done in our lives. That God has chosen you as a person. God chose you. Isn't that good to know? I love the story of two kids in a home. Uh, the parents had had uh, a, a, a difficulty in having children, and so eventually they had adopted a little child. And as often happens is just after they adopted the child, the lady fell pregnant. And so they ended up with two children, which was really great. But one day the mother heard the children arguing. The child that was born of the mother said to her, you don't really belong to this family. I do. I was born as part of this family. The little adopted child thought a moment about that and turned to and said, well, the good thing is, mum had no choice about you, but she chose me. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? And you know what? God chose us. God chose us to be his children. And what he, how he chose us was he extended an invitation to us through Jesus. He said, come unto me and I will give you rest. And so God has chosen us and brought us to himself through convicting us through the Holy Spirit of the wrong things that we've done and leading us to repentance, asking God for forgiveness that we might enjoy that incredible promise of John 1.12 that says, to all who received him, to them gave he power to become children of God. You see, when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're no longer on the outside. You are now born into the family of God. You are now chosen by God to be one of His children. God chose you. One of my, my, my great encouragers in life 
is a guy called Charles Spurgeon. Never knew him. He died before I was even born. But he wrote this, and I loved it. He said, it's just as well God chose me before I was born, because after I was born, and if he saw me today, maybe he wouldn't have chosen me. The good news is God chose you even though he knew everything about you. Because you see, the choice of God is done in eternity, not in a moment. God lives outside of time, and so he saw you before you were even a twinkle in your parents' eyes. And he chose you. But he also set you apart. He, he chose you and then said, I want you to live differently. And the way that we understand and illustrate that best is in a marriage. You know, when you get married, you go up and you say your vows. But what you're really saying is, I am this girl's husband or this girl is my wife. And I'm off the market now. So I wear a ring to declare to all and sundry that I'm not available any longer. You know, that's what happens when we become Christians. We get married to Christ. We become part of His family. And literally what we're saying to the rest of the world is, I am a Christ follower, and I'm no longer open on the market to believe anything else, and I'm not going to go in any other direction. God sets you apart, and we call that being holy. Holy simply means to be right with God. And that's an awesome place to be. Thirdly, God loves you dearly. He says you're dearly loved, not just loved. God doesn't just sort of love you. God loves you with a passion. And you know what? When I think about that, when unbelievers rebel against God and go their own way, breaking the laws of the holy creator and judge, they break his heart. But you know what? When we as Christians sin, we're children of God breaking the heart of our Father. There's a total difference in that pain. Love is the strongest motivating power in the world. And as we grow in our love for God, we grow in our desire to obey Him and to walk with Him in newness of life that we have in Christ. Fourthly, God has forgiven you. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, Paul says. In Colossians 2.13, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, all our wrongdoing. Every time we went against God, God's willing and ready and able to forgive you and to wipe it out like it never exists. You see, God's forgiveness is complete and final. It's not partial. How is the holy God able to forgive guilty people of breaking the law? Because Jesus paid the penalty for our sin on the cross. And because He paid our penalty, we can go free. And so we've been chosen by God. We've been set apart for God. We are loved by God. And we're forgiven by God. And so Paul reminds us of who we are. This is our identity, and it should determine how we act. When we relate to people, we don't know where they are in their lives. They don't, we don't know what they're going through. We don't know what their environment is like. But we do know what we're supposed to be like. You see the difference? How do I live with difficult people? Because I am called by God to live differently. And instead of living in a response to bad attitudes, I live as somebody with a good attitude in the midst of bad attitudes. And you know what? That's a real challenge to us. That goes against the flow. Do unto others before they do unto you. No, no, that's not what Scripture says. Scripture says do unto others what you would have them do to you. And so the whole Christian faith is about being countercultural. The whole Christian faith is about living by a different set of standards and by acknowledging that we are chosen of God to live this life. You see, if others want to stir up trouble at work or cause friction in your family life or create chaos within the church, 
you can choose to be different. And that's what God's asking us to do. He's asking us to be better, not to be bitter. That we need to be different in our world. Remember that you're not perfect either. You know, have you noticed how it's always the other person who is at fault? Lord, if only you gave me a different wife, I would be such a, a good person. Well, you know what? You're a good person because God gave you your wife. And because she challenges you the way she does. Because God is able to, in grace, work in your life through that circumstance. And you know what? I think that very often your wife needs the medal rather than you do. Because you've messed up more than once. You know what it's like to need forgiveness. That's why Paul says in Colossians 3.13, Forgive as the Lord forgave you. How does the Lord forgive us? Totally and perfectly. It's not conditional. If you live differently and you behave differently, I will forgive you. It's a case of, you know what, I'm going to forgive you anyway. And that is the challenge that we face. That we're to show others the same mercy we have been shown by Christ. You see, you're one of God's people, and your actions should prove it. The secondly, Paul goes on in these verses and says you need to choose your feelings. So firstly, we need to recognize who we are. We're children of God. But then he goes on and says choose your feelings, Colossians 2, 12 to 14. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. And if any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Have you ever got dressed to go to work or school? And you have an HRV in your home or we've got a smart vent? And what it does is it pushes the warm air from the ceiling into the house, keeps it a bit toastier. And you've got dressed for the day, and you open that front door, and you are hit by a wintry blast that you hadn't encountered inside. And you suddenly look down and think, I'm not going to survive today dressed like this. I'm going to have to go get a jacket or put something warmer on. Have you ever done that? I find I have to do it often. And in a sense, that's what we need to do. As Christians, sometimes we open the door and we face some challenges in life, and, and they are so uh, aggressive, negative. They're like a storm that come against us. And you know what we've got to do? We've got to put on right attitudes. We've got to choose to do what is right. Paul says, clothe yourselves. It's not up to God to put these attitudes on you. It's you who has to choose them. And you know what? Honestly, that's tough. I'm a little like you. Sometimes I grit my teeth and say, God, I don't want to love this person. I'd rather give them a smack. That's real. But you know what? I've got to choose to be different. I've got to choose to live out who God is in my life. Clothe yourself. The phrase clothe yourself is so appropriate because sometimes we've got to cover our feelings and put on or choose right attitudes and behavior. Through the years, we've been lied to about our feelings. We've been told that if we feel something, it must be real. And the other thing we've been told is that we should verbalize our feelings. And you know what? There is a place for that, and there is a time for that. But you know what I've found in life? That when I'm angry or hurt or frustrated, I make the best speech I would like to forget. Have you noticed that? I say things that I, I wish I could take back. But there's no way you can take back a spoken word. And the impact 
goes on and on and on. You see, voicing hostile, angry, cruel, resentful words isn't going to help the situation. And so I've got to learn to choose not to respond that way. I've got to learn to choose to clothe myself with the attitude of God. You see, you don't have to let your feelings control your actions. In fact, your feelings should be way the bottom of the list. I once saw a little picture of a, 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 one of those old locomotives, you know, with the steam coming out of the top with two cars on it. One was a, a coal um, carrier and one was a passenger um, car. And they put names on them. And they said that the train needed to be intellect. The coal car needed to be will. And the passenger car needs to be emotions. Why? Because we need to live by what we know is right. We've got to choose to do what we know is right. And when we do, the passenger car follows along. In our world, we are, we are, we are taught differently. That we are to let emotions drive us. And simply, that is never a good idea. Paul tells us to put on compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. You may not feel these things, but you can choose to put them on. Isn't that hypocritical? Not at all. I'm not saying I feel good about you. I'm not wanting to put my arm around you and give you a hug, but I can still choose to be compassionate. I can still choose to be kind. I can still choose to be humble. I can still choose to be gentle, and I can still choose to be patient no matter what I feel about the situation that you and I are in. You see, the simple truth is we will be judged by our actions, not by our feelings. And so 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. See, so what the Lord's really speaking to us about is the fact that we've got to choose our feelings. You can't always control the way you feel, but you can control the way you dress. Dress for success. Clothe yourself with compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Does this mean that we sweep conflict under the carpet? No, of course not. But it means that we deal with conflict through compassion, through kindness, with humility with gentleness, and with patience. And you know, if you can bring those attitudes to conflict, suddenly conflict is disarmed. So what am I to do to put on compassion? That Greek word speaks about the bowels of compassion. <laughs> we don't really talk about the bowels of compassion anymore in our English world, but what they were trying to indicate was the depth of this compassion. That this compassion would come from the center of your being. That it wouldn't be superficial. That it wouldn't be something that you put on and off. But that this compassion would be so innate within you that it would flow out of you. That's the type of compassion we're to put on, the compassion of God. That even though we rebelled against him even though we hated him, even though we spoke badly of him. God still loved us enough to send Jesus. That's compassion. He didn't give us what we deserve. He gave us a hope and a future. Secondly, we're to put on kindness. We've been saved through God's kindness. We don't deserve it. God is kind. We've done everything we can to break the law. 
And you know what? Honestly, the law doesn't have the right to forgive you. The law only has the right to punish you. And that's why Jesus died in your place. So that the righteous, right requirements of God's law could be met. And you could go free. And God did that because He's kind. Because He cares about you. Because He wants what's best for you. In fact, in Ephesians 4, verse 32, Paul writes and says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Do you see how often those three come together? Kind, compassionate, forgive. Kind, compassionate, forgive. Kind, compassionate, forgive. You know what? Whenever, whenever we see something like that, you've got to understand you're going to have to do it. And it's not going to be easy. That's why it's repeated again and again and again. One of the greatest pictures of kindness in the Old Testament is King David. Do you remember King David, and, uh, who was the king of, of Israel? And Saul and Jonathan. Jonathan was David's best friend. Uh, Jonathan was Saul's uh, son. Saul was the king of Israel. Uh, an ungodly man who turned his back and did what was wrong and evil in the sight of God. And as a consequence, during battle both he and his son Jonathan were killed and David became king in his place we have heard the story I'm sure but in those days what they did was they killed every member of the family of the king that had died so that there could be no uprising in the nations what did David do because of his deep friendship with Jonathan, he wanted to show kindness to the house of Saul. So he looks for any remaining members, and there's only one, a guy called Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth, he's paralyzed from the waist down. When he was a baby, his um, nurse was running from the invaders, and she dropped him. And he was disabled from the waist down. So what did David do? He took him into his own home and treated him like his son. That's kindness. Did Mephibosheth deserve it? No. But David did it anyway. And that's such an awesome picture of what God does for you and I. We don't deserve it, but in his kindness, he takes us. We must put on humility. In Paul's day and age, humility wasn't something that was admired. Humility was often regarded as weakness. They admired people of strength and pride and control, people who demonstrated that they were uh, powerful and, and, and wealthy. Jesus was an affront to them. Why? Because he was gentle, meek, and mild. And so when he speaks about humility, I wonder if Paul is thinking back to Philippians 2. That Jesus not thinking of equality with God as something that should be grasped or held on to at any cost. But he gave it all up for you and me. Humility. He gave it all up and became a person with all our limitations, with all our frustrations, he gave up everything for you and me. Gentleness. Gentleness isn't weakness. Please understand it. The Greek word is really important. It refers to a power. Uh, it refers to a wind storm. It, it refers to medicine. It refers to a horse. And you know what? Each one of those things can be controlled. Think about a yacht in a storm. It can put its sails in such a way as to use the power of the wind for its own benefit. That's meekness. That's the picture of meekness. Taking something that is destructive and turning it around for good. Medicine, too much, can kill you. But in the right dose can be just what you needed. A horse, wild horse, can buck and can stomp you to death 
And yet if it's trained and brought into control, that's the picture of meekness. Taking power and bringing it into control. Put on patience. <laughs> when the Lord says you're going to have to be patient, guess what that means? There are going to be people who try your patience. My old mum, she was a saint. She had me. She had to be a saint. But the reality was, she said this to me. She said, son, don't ever pray for patience. I said, why, mum? She said, how do you think you learn patience? You learn patience not as an academic exercise. You learn patience <laughs> in the crucible of affliction and opposition and frustration. That's where we learn patience. I've never prayed for patience. You know what? It didn't make any difference. The Lord gave me you. And you've been so patient with me. <laughs> I love you guys. You know that. But it, the word literally means to be long-tempered. means that I'm not just going to fly off the handle. means that I'm not going to just snap at you if you snap at me. Patience means that we're not always going to agree, but I will listen and I will hear and I will keep myself in control and I will choose to be patient. Sixthly, Paul says, bear with each other. Literally, it means to hold up or to hold back. And, and what it's saying is meekness, long-suffering and bearing with each other go together. Why? Because I've got to put up with you. Not just grit my teeth and put up with you. I've got to grit my teeth and love you. It's even worse. But the simple truth is we've got to learn to do that for one another. Bearing with each other's idiosyncrasies. When we don't agree, when we don't see eye to eye, I've got to welcome you and to make you feel a part of the family. I've got to put on forgiveness. This is the logical result of all that Paul has written so far in this section. It's not enough that Christians put up with grief and provocation and refuse to retaliate. We must also forgive troublemakers. If we don't, then feelings of bitterness will develop in our hearts, and, and these can lead to greater wrongdoing. It's Christ-like to forgive. Ephesians 4.32, again, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. How? Just as Christ, as in Christ, God forgave you. Forgiveness opens us up to the fullness of the love of God. Forgiveness removes the barriers between us and other people. And finally, he says, put on love. Can I just say that love in the Greek is agape. Agape is a word that speaks about a, a sacrificial giving of yourself for another. The sacrificial giving of yourself for another. So when the Bible says that God loved us, it says God agape us, loved us so much, he gave his son. And then we're commanded as husbands and wives to love one another, to, uh, to put the other person's interests before my own. That's what agape is all about. And that's the type of love we are to have for others. Where we put them before ourselves. Where we put their needs before our needs and where we are more concerned about their feelings than about our feelings. You see, all that we've spoken about, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, and forgiveness all flow from this attitude of love. And that's why Paul says, put it on it, it covers everything. Because when we love one another, when we put each other first before ourselves, 
then compassion is the result. And kindness flows. And humility, because I'm not thinking of myself as being more important than I really am. When love rules our lives, it unites all these spiritual virtues and brings us to a sense of spiritual maturity. And so, you see, that's why we talk about going against the flow. We're in a dog-eat-dog world. We're in a world where we're told that we must do whatever it takes to get ahead. We are told that we must look out for number one. We are told that you are the most important person in this world. We are told that you deserve it. Jesus says, I want you to put others before yourself. Jesus says, I want you to live differently. Jesus says, I want you to be like me. Not turning people away, but reaching out to them and including them and helping them find life. You see, if we're going to go against the flow, we've got to learn to be like Jesus. We've got to learn to allow the nature of God who loves all people everywhere to fill our lives and to direct our actions and our activities. So what do you do when people rub you up the wrong way? Show them compassion. Show them kindness. Show them humility. Show them gentleness. Show them patience. Bear with them. Forgive them. And love them. And you know what the Bible tells us? God's given us the ability to do that. We've got to put it on. We've got to choose.